Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all here at the Institute of Social Studies on behalf of the Executive Board of Erasmus University. A special welcome, of course, to Dr. Stella Kimball, her family, colleagues, friends. Dr. Kimball will deliver an inaugural address as professor to the Prince Klaus Chair in Development and Equity. The Prince Klaus Chair, ladies and gentlemen, was established by, jointly by the ISS, the Institute of Social Studies, and Utrecht University in the appreciation of Prince Klaus of the Netherlands for his commitment to and deep knowledge of development and social justice here and throughout the world. As you may know, the Institute of Social Studies has joined forces two years ago with Erasmus University. And our university is particularly proud of the addition of development studies to the gamut of educational programs that we offer because the Institute of Social Studies is a key player in the field and highly regarded for its academic work here and abroad. A few words about the program of this afternoon. First, please check your phones um, so that they will not disturb the lecture. In a few moments, Dr. Kimball will present her inaugural lecture titled Science, Bridges, Policy, Reforms, and Children's Health Lessons from a Policy Experiment in the Philippines. But before she will be given the floor, I would like to ask my colleague, the Rector of the Institute of Social Studies, to say a few words about her work, to introduce her and her work. Please. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, dear guests, students and colleagues. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce to you Professor Stella Kimbo. She was born in the Philippines. She obtained her PhD in economics from the School of Economics of the University of the Philippines. And after obtaining a degree, she spent postdoctoral year as a postdoctoral fellow at Brown University, one of the U.S. leading research universities. Then she returned to the Philippines and currently she holds a position as professor at the School of Economics at the University of the Philippines. Professor Kimbo's field of specialization is in the areas of public health, public economics, and development. She has published widely on topics such as insurance design, provider incentives, access to health care, health care performance, as well as child nutrition and cognitive development. And she has published in all these areas internationally in well-ranked peer-reviewed journals. Professor Kimbo was involved in an innovative policy experiment called the Quality Improvement Demonstration Study. This is a multi-institutional collaboration in the Philippines between the universities, the health department, and the Health Insurance Corporation. Its primary objective is to evaluate health insurance expansion coupled with quality improving performance-based payments of providers. The study will also return in Professor Kimbo's lecture. It's precisely this expertise in cutting-edge international research on improved access to health care by the poor and vulnerable that made Professor Kimbo the perfect candidate for the Prince Klaus Chair in Development and Equity 2011 2013. We are very proud and honored that you will work with us here at ISS and with our colleagues in Erasmus University. And we are grateful to Votro Science for Global Development uh, to support her efforts. 
Professor Kimbo, I would like to invite you to take my place in order to deliver your inaugural lecture. Dear Royal Highness, Mayor, the Curatorium of the Prince Klaus Chair, Rector Magnificae, Chair of the Executive Board of the Erasmus University, ISS Rector, Your Excellencies, Standard Students of the ISS, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. I have chosen to tell you a story about health policy reforms in the Philippines. Many times during the lecture, I will be specific in detail and in context, attempting to address the concern that what we know today is simply not any level of detail that is useful to the policymaker. I hope that my story will illustrate the need to balance two objectives of health policy research. On the one hand, answering the what works and how to questions, and on the other hand, generating a sufficient amount of rigor to justify adoption of policy. Today, pneumonia and diarrhea are still among the leading causes of deaths of young Filipino children. The technology to prevent and cure these illnesses is available, but unfortunately not within arm's length of poorer families. The lack of income is an obvious barrier, given that over a quarter of all Filipinos are considered poor. There could also be information barriers, preventing parents from bringing their sick children to the health facility in a timely manner. On the supply side, doctors may not have the incentive to provide the appropriate care. There are more ways than one to break these barriers, but this afternoon I focus on only one way, policy. Can policy change how households demand health care? Can policy change the way doctors prescribe treatment? Ultimately we ask, can policy improve health and prevent deaths? We further ask, Will any kind of health policy do? In the context of the Philippines, we believe that it is specifically social health insurance by its sheer size and inertia, which can be the policy platform for the needed changes. The National Health Insurance Program of the Philippines was created in 1995 and mandated to provide universal coverage by 2010. To fulfill this mandate, PhilHealth, which is the corporation that administers the NHIP, introduced multiple enrollment schemes for different population groups. For the formal sector, membership is compulsory. For the indigent households, membership is fully subsidized by the government. For retirees, membership is automatic. For the rest of the population, primarily the informal sector, they can voluntarily participate but must pay the full premiums. Today, PhilHealth is the largest insurance carrier in the country. Official figures indicate that 82% of the population were covered in 2011. While this figure could be overstated, way overstated, the NHIP remains the dominant third party in the country. There is perhaps an even larger context to the question we pose, which is the role of PhilHealth in poverty reduction. On the average, Filipino households pay about 54% of all healthcare expenditures from their own pockets. The average hospital expenditure is estimated at about one-third of the annual income per capita, implying that a single hospital confinement can push a family into poverty. And so we ask, does PhilHealth provide sufficient protection against catastrophic health expenditures of a magnitude that can potentially make one poor? But we ask equally important longer-term questions. Does PhilHealth influence demand and supply in a way that health status improves so that in the long run, poor children have a better chance of escaping poverty? What we have here is a simple and linear way of thinking about our propositions. Health insurance alters the way people make decisions about buying and selling health care. Insurance makes healthcare cheaper and would normally make people want more healthcare when needed. On the other hand, healthcare providers are now faced with potential patients with a greater ability to pay. 
When the insured patient and the healthcare provider meet, we typically expect an increased needs of healthcare. We then hypothesize on what might happen next. Increased use of healthcare can mean reducing previously unmet health needs or delays in seeking healthcare when sick. Increased use of healthcare with increased financial protection provided by insurance. And this can further insulate households from financial shocks and prevent disruptions in meals of the entire family because one member had to be hospitalized. Increased use of healthcare can also result in better technology or higher quality care. This effect had been documented in the US for neonatal care, in Vietnam for pediatric care, in India for catastrophic care, and in Ghana for maternal care. In the long run, healthier children can perform better in school. Better schooling outcomes can then translate into improved labor productivity and then higher incomes. Ultimately, all these health gains can facilitate exits from poverty and will benefit future generations. The simple question, does health insurance improve health, has of course been asked by others. Yet some say there are no definitive answers. Or that one must draw conclusion, conclusions based on the weight of the available evidence. Still some say that the question remains largely unanswered at the level of detail needed to inform policy decisions. The literature has a lot of evidence of varying rigor from a wide range of settings and using different types of data. Our idea was to test these independent pieces of evidence in a single setting. In other words, we wanted to answer the very general question in a highly specific context in a manner that is useful for policy. Moreover, by randomizing our policy interventions, we cannot properly identify the causal effects of health insurance on health, similar to how randomized clinical trials are used to test new drugs. In 2003, we embarked on the Philippine Child Health Experiment with ample support from the U.S. National Institutes for Health. The experiment became known as QIDS, short for Quality Improvement Demonstration Study, or KIDS a convenient reminder that children are the intended beneficiaries of the study. At this point, allow me to describe our experiment design. Referring again to our framework, we designed two hospital-level interventions, each linked to specific insurance pathways to health. The access intervention attempts to address unmet health needs, promoting the use of hospital care when needed. In addition, the access intervention seeks to reduce out-of-pocket expenditures for hospital care. The bonus intervention was intended to tap into the quality pathway, providing financial incentives to hospital staff for improved quality of care. The access intervention, or intervention A, provided full insurance coverage for hospitalized children. To ensure Sufficient field health enrollment, we hired and deployed what we call policy navigators. They are medical doctors who performed enhanced social marketing for field health and regularly followed up the local governments on their premium subsidies for the indigent households. The kids' policy navigators managed to increase NHIP enrollment by an average of 36 percentage points compared to only 18 in the controls. On the other hand, the bonus intervention or intervention B, provided a mechanism for additional PhilHealth payments or bonuses for the hospital staff, provided that the hospital was assessed to have met quality standards. Regular quality monitoring was an integral component of intervention B. We developed a simple quality metric consisting of clinical care quality, patient satisfaction, and number of patients served. And of course, in the control sites, it was business as usual. Clinical care was assessed through exam-like instruments called clinical practice vignettes. These are written case scenarios followed by questions for doctors to answer on how they would manage a specific case. The kids' vignettes were scored, were, were scored blindly, also by physicians, and the resulting vignette scores constituted a large part of the kids' quality metric. Quality assessments and bonus payments were done quarterly. 
Shown here are some portions of a vignette. It starts with a simple description of a patient, in this case, a three-year-old with diarrhea, and then followed by questions on what the doctor will do. And as the vignette progresses, more and more information is provided to the doctor, and thus more complex questions follow. The study was conducted in four central regions of the Philippines, primarily in the Visayas group of islands, which cover about one-third of the land area of the country. The kids' study sites were in 30 pre-selected hospital districts in 11 provinces. An estimated 1 million households were potential beneficiaries in these hospitals. Children ages 5 and under were the target population groups. Our study sites were carefully selected to minimize spillovers across sites and to maximize the impact for the target beneficiaries. The sites were geographically isolated and sufficiently far from the capital towns, limiting crossover of people between intervention sites and bypass of district hospitals in favor of provincial hospitals, typically perceived to be better. Most of the sites are rural, many of the residents are poor, and depend on either fishing or farming as their source of income. On the average, families have three children, with some families having as many as a dozen children. In every province, we chose three districts, which were carefully matched according to basic demand and supply characteristics, such as population, household income, and number of hospital beds. Then the ABC interventions were randomly assigned among triplet districts within every province. In all, we had 10 match blocks of triplet hospitals. We collected several outcome measures. For health status, we collected anthropometrics, subjective health rating, and objective health markers derived from blood tests. The blood tests were used to indicate infection, nutritional status, anemia, and lead levels. Subjective health ratings were given by mothers for their sick children. One advantage of subjective health ratings is that they're sensitive measures, reflecting small changes in health status over short periods of time. In addition, we found that mother's subjective health ratings consistently predicted the objective health measures. Perhaps mothers truly know best when it comes to their children. To measure cognitive development, we conducted standard psychological tests for young children from which we computed IQ levels. We also collected intermediate outcome variables, namely insurance status and claims, healthcare use and expenditures, and quality of care. We conducted several types of surveys. In every district, we had a facility survey in the government-owned hospital. In every hospital, we conducted physician surveys and clinical practice vignettes, randomly selecting five physicians who typically attend to pediatric patients. In every hospital, we also have patient exit polls on the day of hospital discharge. Four to ten weeks after the patient exit polls, we conducted follow-up surveys in their homes including another round of blood collection. We also performed the IQ tests during the follow-home surveys. You can just imagine how popular we were with the kids in the villages. <laughs> These surveys were implemented in both rounds of data collection. During the baseline round, however, we implemented an additional random sample of 1,500 households. During the second survey round, we also followed up on a subsample of first-round patients, thus creating a panel of patients. We conducted baseline data collection in 2003. The ABC interventions were subsequently introduced in 2004, and the follow-up surveys were done in 2007. Smaller data collection efforts were undertaken every quarter using an abridged version of the patient exits and facility surveys. These were done to monitor the progress of our interventions and facilitate the payment of bonuses. By the end of the project, we had collected over 1.5 million pieces of data. Our response rates were better than average and had very little loss during follow-up interviews. We hired a field staff of about 100 individuals, which included medical technologists who drew blood and tested the samples, psychologists who conducted the IQ tests, pathologists who ran our laboratory, and MD supervisors who acted as policy navigators. We practiced what we preached and paid speed and quality bonuses to our field staff. Today, 
We have published our findings in 65 publications, including 19 peer-reviewed articles and 35 abstracts submitted and presented in conferences. Here is a summary of our key findings. First, unmet needs can be costly. Prior to kids, slightly more than a quarter of patients were admitted to the hospital with delay. In the short run, we found that such delay causes hospital charges to increase by about 5 euros, or 5 times the daily poverty threshold. Delay also has longer-term cost implications in the form of worse health. Delay is associated with an increased likelihood of wasting, or low weight for height, and having an infection at the time of hospital discharge. When this happens, the household faces further health problems and presumably spends an additional amount of money for health care. Second, health insurance can reduce unmet needs. In the same study, we found that expanded insurance benefits reduce delays by about five percentage points, equivalent to 50 fewer children seeking health care with delay. Third, expanded health insurance can improve health outcomes. At the time of the patient's discharge from the hospital, we actually found no health status differences across treatment and control sites. But this is not too surprising given that a doctor's discharge decision is mostly clinical and which should not be discriminating against uninsured patients. We, however, found that when we compared health status four to 10 weeks after hospital discharge, health status was better in the treatment sites. Children who were confined in the treatment hospitals were less likely to have an infection, in, in short, less likely to have a relapse, and le less likely to have prolonged weight loss. Perhaps health insurance, by paying for the hospital bill, shields households from financial shocks and promotes regularity of food consumption at home. Our next set of findings concerns intervention B, or the bonus intervention, which is a type of performance-based financing scheme. Although BBFs have become increasingly popular, few studies have rigor rigorously studied their impacts. The most comprehensive review of BBF schemes by Witter et al. assessed kids as the only one among the studies reviewed with a quote-unquote low risk of bias. And having hopefully convinced you about the worthiness of our study, let me proceed to our fourth key finding, which is that bonus payments can improve the quality of care. In this figure, I show the vignette or quality scores of doctors in all sites, whether treatment or control. Over the five-year study period, vignette scores increased by a maximum of 10 percentage points in the bonus sites. The quality improvements were observed only 12 months after the project started, but were sustained throughout the remainder of the study period. You would perhaps notice that there were unexpected effects. Vignette scores also improved in the access sites. One possible explanation is that increased insurance enrollment in the access sites incre increased hospital revenues, which in turn drove quality improvements. What's even more surprising, we also found quality improvements in control sites after 36 months. And we attribute this to monitoring and feedback, which were done in all sites, whether treatment or control. Fifth, bonus payments can improve health outcomes. We found improvements in general self-reported health, or GSRH, and reduced wasting among children in the bonus hospitals. Despite its being subjective, the improvements in GSRH are important because previous studies show that worse GSRH predicts mortality and larger healthcare expenditures. For wasting, the improvements observed in the bonus sites were interestingly about the same magnitude as that found in the access sites. Like GSRH, improvements in anthropometric outcomes such as wasting are predictors of less chronic disease later in life, better schooling performance, higher labor productivity, and income attainment. While the quality pathway to health is clearly at work here, we could only hypothesize that when doctors know their stuff better, perhaps children recover faster, which mothers feel, and children are less prone to weight loss. Sixth, improved quality can be cost-reducing. 
We found a U-shaped relationship between costs and quality of care. At low levels of quality, below 60%, every 10 percentage point increase in quality was associated with an average 20% decline in hospital charges. Beyond the 60% threshold, every 10 percentage point increase in quality was associated with an average of 22% increase in hospital charges. While it is not too clear why the cost function is U-shaped, this finding may have useful policy implications. When quality is low to begin with, if some money is spent today on financial incentives for doctors, more money can be saved tomorrow because doctors do a better job. Seventh, public policy can affect quality of privately provided care, which is an important subtle effect of the kids' interventions. We found that when quality improved in the public hospitals, there was a 41% increase in the probability that quality would also improve among private doctors. Market forces seem to be at work here. When quality in public hospitals improves, patients previously using private facilities are induced to shift to public hospitals. In a bid to protect their market share, private hospitals respond by improving quality as well. We find this result useful, particularly for countries like the Philippines, where the private sector is self-regulated and where it is very costly for government to use direct influence, instruments of influence over the private sector. Eight. I have 80 actually. <laughs> Wait, eight. Bonus payments can be relatively cost effective. In an ongoing study, we ask whether access or bonus is more cost effective. As shown earlier, access and bonus have been found to have impacts on wasting of comparable magnitude. However, the nature of the costs of access and bonus markedly differ. The main difference from a costing perspective is that intervention B had greater spillover effects compared to A. The direct benefits of intervention A accrued only to the insured individuals. By contrast, quality improvements benefited all users of B hospitals whether insured or not. Taking all of these into consideration, we found that the kids' bonus intervention was more cost-effective than the access intervention. In the global development context, one might ask whether the kids' experience can be used to generalize about reforms. But as two economists point out, that is an empirical question. And the growing body of evidence is helping us answer it scientifically. Hundreds of randomized evaluations of anti-poverty programs are now being conducted all over the world. While each evaluation is carefully crafted to describe one part of the development puzzle, many pieces are starting to come together. We humbly offer kids as one such piece of the puzzle. Perhaps some of the lessons we learned from the experiment, particularly on how we ran it, can be generalized. First, it takes a village to initiate reforms. KIDS was made possible through a partnership that was forged between highly diverse groups. The Department of Health defined the overall direction of reforms. The PhilHealth implemented and mostly financed the interventions, while the two academic institutions, UCSF's Institute for Global Health and the UPCON Foundation, to which I belong, constituted the study team and secured the funding for the research activities. In addition, there were 11 local governments, each of which signed off on a memorandum of agreement indicating their voluntary participation in the study, which included randomized interventions. These institutional partners clearly have very diverse interests. The DOH at that time had its health sector reform agenda to steer. The field health was open to the idea of innovation, but any action taken had to be, quote-unquote, cost-neutral. The local governments were represented by governors who at the time of buy-in had re-election to worry about. The academics, of course, were under constant pressure to produce publications. But beyond these parochial interests was a single development goal that effectively bound everyone, the welfare of our children. It was clear from the very beginning that the research had to be conducted in a way, in such a way that diverse interests would be recognized. Conflict would naturally arise at times, and the task was, in the language of economists, to optimize in the face of participation constraints. Timing is of the essence. Kids was fortunate to have been conceived at a time 
when the required funding was available, when the Philippine government was seriously considering healthcare reforms, and when the Department of Health was led by an advocate of evidence-based reforms. In 2003, the questions of the DOH were mostly geared towards how-to questions, having had a relatively large baseline study undertaken in the 1990s. Both academic institutions had sufficient capacity to undertake a huge scientific study that was logistically complex. In the case of my institution, we had benefited from a previous capacity building efforts through a USAID funded program that ran from 1991 to 1996. The time was right for a policy experiment. Simple reforms can be powerful ones. The kids interventions were carefully designed in a way that current operations of the field health would be minimally disrupted. This reduced implementation difficulties, the need for new processes and paperwork. The training needed was minimal. Both the access and bonus interventions were implemented by simple reclassification mechanisms. The kids' quality score is a straightforward measure encompassing only three numbers. Because of its simplicity, the hospital staff easily understood how they would be assessed. Simplicity reduces the costs of implementing reforms and reduces resistance among the ranks. A sense of ownership is needed for sustainability. Reforms stand a greater chance of succeeding if they are self-imposed. The KIDS proposal was jointly submitted for funding by the partner institutions. The KIDS interventions were also jointly conceptualized and eventually formalized in a field health operations manual. Still, there were sectors within the field health which, up to the very end of the project, questioned their participation in KIDS or the rationality of the interventions, suggesting that there were, in fact, some unresolved issues of ownership. Securing ownership could be tedious, but would have the long-term advantage of commitment to a national rollout. As I reflect on why PhilHealth has not yet acted upon the substantial evidence that kids have so far produced, I wonder whether the explanation is related to having had fewer than expected champions from within PhilHealth. Science bridges reforms and children's health. And so, does health insurance improve health? Yes, we believe so. Health insurance can make hospitals spend more so that this crowd room can be improved because there are now more patients to serve. Or health insurance can induce doctors to make better clinical decisions in the face of resource constraints. Health insurance can be a powerful agent of change. Our carefully planned and executed experiment illustrates that indeed policy can improve health. And the science behind the kids experiment ensures that the bridge linking reforms and health is a causal one. Our takeaway messages are as follows. Expanding health insurance reduces unmet health needs and also improves quality. Paying doctors more but tying the additional payments to quality will actually improve quality. These policy interventions are worthy investments. In the short run, they reduce the hospital bills. In the long run, health status improvements defray future health expenditures. Many times we have asked ourselves whether the undertaking was well worth the tremendous amount of effort and resources. And every single time, we say yes, it was. From our collective experience, we know that policy making is typically devoid of scientific evidence and is the product of the political process and personal opinion rather than careful analysis. In the past, policymakers have made costly mistakes. Evidence-based policy making might be more expensive in the short run, but results in cost-effective policies in the long run. Kids officially closed in 2008, but we believe that we have left an important mark in the Philippine health policy arena. Our findings have set the bar of decision-making higher and triggered a deeper commitment to health sector reforms. Some of the policy debates continue, but kids' findings now form part of the growing evidence base of Philippine health policy. I certainly hope that the kids' research has not yet ended, and perhaps this lecture would mark the beginning of collaboration, particularly with the Dutch community. There are still many questions to ask, and which can be answered with existing kids' data. Did, did the reform gains translate into improved IQs? 
Was there increased financial risk protection? Did the poor benefit more than the richer households? There are also important questions that can be answered but for which additional data is needed. Will the reform gains result in long-term health effects such as reduced mortality rates and improved schooling performance? After kids had stopped paying bonuses to doctors, did the quality of care deteriorate? There are clearly many more questions that can be asked, perhaps some beyond the context of the Philippines. It would certainly be a pleasure to pursue this research agenda with a community like the ISS whose commitment to the pursuits of development and equity is unquestionable. Allow me to end with some words of thanks. I would like to thank the Curatorium of the PCC for nominating me as chairholder and then the Executive Board of the Erasmus University for appointing me as full professor. I thank the WODRO for supporting the PCC research agenda through its funding of postdoctoral researchers, particularly, particularly Natasha Wagner, who is, I believe, with us this afternoon. To the ISS Director, Professor Dian, Rene Delo, Linda Johnson, thank you for welcoming, welcoming me to the ISS community, the ISS professors, student staff, thank you for the support. Professor Michael Grimm, from the very beginning of my stint, has ensured that everything, my program, my housing, my office, runs properly. He has introduced me to many of you in ISS, including his beautiful family, in a serious effort to get research collaborations going with some healthy doses of a social life. Thank you, Michael and Florence. To Natasha Wagner, the HAPPA Group, and the Rotterdam Global Health Initiative, including professors Eddie Wendors, Lair, Owen O'Donnell, uh, Ellen Van Der Poel and Godaliba Van Hatteren, thank you for the interesting conversations and I look forward to future collaborations. Professor John B. Body and Professor Orville Solon are not here today, but I certainly cannot end this lecture without a profuse thank you to them. They were the principal investigators of KIDS who got me involved in a major way even before KIDS officially started. I was a newly hired assistant professor then, with hardly any project and publications experience, but they chose me anyway. Kids was an important part of my life for close to eight years. It was my family, teacher, and student, source of joy, pain, and pride, all profoundly rolled into one. Thank you, John and Orville, for making me a part of kids. My mom is also not here, but I would like to thank her for introducing me to the world of academia and the true meaning of public service. The biggest thank you goes to my husband, Miro, who has from the very beginning been supportive of all my endeavors. I would not be standing before you today if it were not for him taking over my mommy duties to our four beautiful children, Mario, Leon, Beth, and Duque, despite this incredibly busy schedule. Thank you, Miro, for all the love, caring, and understanding. Sa aking minamahal na kababayan, nagdumalo ngayong hapon, lalo na sa aking kababatang si Maita, Maraming salamat po. Sama-sama po natin iangat ang ating inong bayan. And to all of you here today, thank you for listening to my story. accepting your professorial chair. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kimbo has reminded us that academic research can play a role in ordering some of the policy-making processes. But her argument went beyond that, beyond changing behavior of policymakers and health workers. She has actually demonstrated that policy measures can result in better health of children. You have argued that the creation of a policy environment that encourages participation, accountability, and the use of evidence-based decision-making can lead to development and equity. And in passing, you have showed that combining fundamental and applied research can be done in one single undertaking. We are looking forward to have you here at ISS. We are looking forward 
to your collaboration with the colleagues in the Rotterdam Global Health Initiative and with other colleagues in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you to the reception in the atrium on the first floor. You are kindly requested to follow us. Don't take pictures. Wait until the cortege has left the auditorium. Moreover, I urge you not to form a queue in order to congratulate our new, new professor, but first take a drink, enjoy the reception, and wait for a suitable moment to offer your congratulations. Thank you.